Welcome to Café Realist. Uh, my guest was just asking me oh, for how long I've been doing this. It feels like years, uh, centuries, uh, actually 20 episodes we've been streaming. Uh, Ellen, care to introduce yourself to Hi. the viewers? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Helen Gould. I work in games as an editor and a sensitivity reader, but I also write for them. Um, I've not done my own game yet, and possibly won't, but I've done a, I've been like a writer for other people's games a lot. And you might know me from the Rusty Quill Gaming Podcast, where I play Azu, who is a six foot six orc paladin in glowing pink armor. So you've been playing the same character from the beginning of the Rusty Quill because you've been asking me how much oh. how long I've been doing that but how long have you been doing that so uh the gaming podcast has been going since I think 2015 but uh one of the players had to leave because he decided to go have a kid and we we're all very disappointed <laughs> um but uh they needed some they needed a new fourth player so they held auditions and um I knew both Ben and Lydia who play other characters on the show and they recommended me. I went, we did a little one shot and um, I'm still there. Cool. Yeah, so actually the episode, <laughs> I, now, two years. I haven't listened that much to the Rusty Quill. I listened to it when I organized the first podcast zone, I think, to, to inform myself. And uh, we, We've got a very serious vetting program at uh, the podcast zone uh, at Dragon Meat. So, but no, but I try to listen to to everyone. So maybe you were not in there already. I should I should check another episode. I probably wasn't, honestly. Um, and for those who don't know, Rusty Quill is also the same uh, company that does the Magnus Archives, which is so big that I now see it like popping up on my Tumblr, like it, in completely unrelated events. So that's pretty cool to be part of something that's. It, it's on TikTok. It's on TikTok. You got your. TikTok reenactors yeah. doing the Magnus archives. I was like, "Wow, that's they they made it. They really, really made it." Yeah, it's super exciting. Uh, what's the name of uh, your the, the central person in uh, the Magnus archive? Uh, oh, Johnny Sims. Johnny. Yeah, I, I met him a couple of times, and the first time I met him, he, he just sat next to me. I got I got a, a section of one of my episodes recorded with him, and but he is interviewing someone with me. So I, I even we even forgot to make an introduction. So he, he's in there, but he's not even saying his name. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was completely oblivious of uh, well, who's that person. He's another podcaster. So, so what? Um, great. Uh, one of uh, my ice-breaking questions uh, for those 20 episodes under lockdown is, has the lockdown impacted your routine uh, in any fashion? What is your routine like nowadays? Oh... That's kind of a tricky question because, um, so I'm a freelancer, but I also do short-term con short contracts. So um, back in January, I got taken on for a six week contract, but in the middle of it, coronavirus hit <laughs> and um, they extended my contract. So by the time we went into lockdown, I was still with them. I was with them for like another month. But then since I left, I've been mostly sticking to my usual uh, freelance routine in terms of getting at least two things done a day. I've been, I've had a big project that I've been working on, which is like 18,000 words long. It's a setting for a game being made by Draco Studios. And um, I've been trying to do a thousand words on that every morning. And some days that is very hard and some, some days that's very easy. And uh, it just depends. And then the afternoons, it could be, what have I done? It could be audio editing for my, because I have a Patreon where I'm reading a book called White Fang um, as like bedtime reading. The, the I Jack, do other stuff as well. But... The Jack London novel. Yes, the one about the wolf. <laughs> when I was a kid, um, the, the, mo the there was a Disney movie and it was a big hit. And I don't, I don't think anyone, yeah. I don't think anyone remembers that movie. It was like the, the big blockbuster advertised everywhere with even the people would show up being the guest on French TV shows and it, w it would be shown oh. in, in primary schools and, uh, and in school trips <laughs> and uh, yeah five years later pff, 
everybody forgot about I've it. I've never heard of it. I never heard of it. I think do I have a copy of it somewhere? I think they made a oh, remake. <laughs> My actual, my copy of it is one that I bought from my school library because every so often they would have sales of books that nobody was checking out anymore. So they would sell them for like 50p. Um, so it's a really old uh, version now. It's still got my primary school's name in it. Cool. That's awesome. Um, they, probably so forced, yeah, so they probably forced us to read the book also. Been... <laughs> <laughs> so my mornings have all been uh, game writing and then my afternoons have been whatever. And then every other Saturday, I do recording with Rusty Quill. Um, I started live streaming as well. So on a Saturday or a Sunday, I've been doing a baking live stream. And um, I've just started streaming Delta Rune on Monday evenings too. Delta Green, though? Mm. Delta Rune. It's like the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's made by Toby Fox, who did Undertale. Okay. And um, it's like, a... I wouldn't call it a sequel. It's like an alternate universe with some of the some similar characters, and it's a really different tone. It's really interesting. Cool. So, would that mean uh, is uh, have you picked up any new hobby or skills in uh, lockdown? Even yeah, if... the live streaming. The live like, streaming. I never, I never thought that I would be doing that because I always, I always had really crap laptops and I thought there's no way these are going to be able to handle live streaming. But um, my last one complete basically started to fall apart. So I got the new one that I'm using now and it's very beefy. So um, I started live streaming the cooking and baking that I was doing. Wow. So now I can make dough and pastry and um, show people as I'm doing it. <laughs> I was discussing, so I went for to run a little errand today while taking my son to the park, and I was looking for yeast and baking powder for my wife so mm. she could bake. But I don't know if you've seen that there's been a a blog post by a woman who's been doing the the rounds of the internet because she was complaining that fake bakers were holding all the the yeast <laughs> and the, she was a real baker she was doing it before it was the lockdown so all of us we should stop baking because she was a real deal no that yes i saw that it was quite i was quite lucky because um i had entertained the idea of of baking bread before so i already had yeast and stuff that i just hadn't done anything with yet so it seemed like a good time yeah, we got a lot of. Uh, uh, Persephilia purchased a a, a uh, cardboard box full of uh, flowers, uh, flowers, uh, quite a while ago. But now we left like like she ordered I don't know a dozen times one kilograms or something like that, and she made an order with with a friend together. But now we've got oh like God. probably five kilograms left of uh, wool wheat, you know, varieties which are. <laughs> Rare, mm -hmm. and we got tired of it, and we like, like it's like your your big tin box of uh, biscuits, and you're just left with the the shortbreads at the end. Uh, but uh, we, <laughs> we need to plow to through that stock. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I I need to get my some plain flour. I actually I have a couple of packets of flour in my cupboard that I don't actually know what kind of flour they are because I got it from um, the Polish shop down the road and everything is in Polish. I've got no idea, but they have pictures of bread on them. So I'm assuming they're at least, you know, wheat flour, possibly. I don't know if they're bread flour. I don't know if they're plain flour, <laughs> but we'll find out. I'll experiment with them. Okay. So better read, but better, better not be gluten intolerant and visit you in the next few days because you, you have no mean of knowing in Polish if the, the flour well, you don't got. Don't visit uh, me at all, really. <laughs> That's kind of the situation. So, yeah. so you were saying uh, you have no desire of doing your own game after working on so many, so many games, being involved in so many projects. You, mm. you're not tempted to have your your name uh, front and center on the cover or something. <laughs> I mean, um, it's just it's not something that I've put that much thought into like way back over Christmas I was thinking about maybe doing a card game I was thinking of um, uh, how am I going to explain this basically um, doing like a storytelling kind of game with cards and um, it would be kind of like a tarot deck 
like, and you would have to tell the story depending on what card you drew. A bit but like I don't know. I'm a bit huh? a bit like what's Once Upon a Time uh, by James Wallace, or he published it. Maybe he didn't write it. I'm not sure. That's exactly what I was about to say, but I feel like that's probably something people have done before. So <laughs> I mean, you give you give it your own twist. Uh, I'm working so with the lockdown, I, I've moved a bit more seriously into developing my own game, and mm. it's it's not with tarot cards and so on, but there, there's a you could compare it to Once Upon a Time in terms of format, but it's more. Mm. Numbers which are generated by dice rolls and numbers are attached to a, a statistics. Uh, so it's uh, it's a parody of people are going to be tired of me speaking of that. Of you know, do you know that? Is it in reverse? Might be in reverse. Is that say? Is that by Marie Kondo? Yeah, exactly. That's the one. So, ah. so I was uh, handed the book several years ago uh, and something like four years ago. And I thought it was interesting, but it was—I thought it was also uh, there was a high potential for parody, because if you if if you were disingenuous when you were taking uh, some some sentences, uh, I thought it could be quite hilarious. Uh, and so the game revolves av- around a, a character who's a sort of a, a non-corporeal being inspired by Marie Kondo, who's called Paris Gondo, and that being. <laughs> That 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 being advises. Yeah, first of all, uh, they uh, abandoned their uh, physical form and gender because it. One day they realized they did not spark joy to them. So now they they are gender. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they advise adventurers uh, about their their inventory because they should properly pack their inventory to not only succeed <laughs> in their adventures but also have a. Satisfying and uh, invigorating, invigorating. Ah, it's a word I keep stumbling upon. Invigorating uh, life ahead of them. So, so the game is you roll the stats of objects you find, or useful they are, or encumbering they are, and or emotionally attached you are to them. And based on the numbers, these are the numbers are the prompts for you to create the objects. And 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 players come up with crazy things like last session. Someone came up with gold slippers from a, a dwarf king, but gold slippers like cast in gold, <laughs> so slabs of gold, <laughs> in which so because it had an encumbrance of five or six something like that, which is a maximum. So it were gold slippers, but they were magic and they would not make any noise, so they were very useful and they were uh, designed by the king, the dwarf king, because he wanted to. To go steal food in the the fridge without his mother noticing uh, at night, and uh, and yeah, the players trade the objects and then uh, they find out whether they survived as a group individually, and whether they had a happy life after that. So yeah, I'm. Uh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah, I should have you for for a <laughs> session. So so that was my shameless plug. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, so your own card game. What was what was your twist, sort of it? So, just to say, you you can do a new Once Upon a Time if you have your own twist. The, all the games, no, the, no games is fully original. Hmm. I guess that's true. Just like, there's very rare to have an idea that's fully original. I think. Um, so here was the thing. I first started thinking about it as like some kind of, um, I don't know sort of poker kind of game because okay so basically i wrote this uh piece of flash fiction in which there was a card game where um different cards had different kinds of luck attached to them so um if you got the shipwreck that was unlucky but if you got the moon that was lucky and so you'd have to try and pair um the lucky cards and get rid of your unlucky cards by passing them off to other players um but it got the mechanics of it got really complicated and as anyone who has played with me knows i'm not i'm not good at mechanics and rules and that's mainly if i'm being honest that's why i've stayed away from making my own game because i'm just i um i like as few rules as possible basically so much so that i don't even want to write my own <laughs> that's interesting because you seem to be going for for something which is a 
uh, story game slash board game and they're slightly more mechanically heavy than something like a role playing game. So wouldn't you be more interested in yeah, creating I mean, a setting for they something? Two, they were two really different ideas. I was I still wanted um, there to be lucky and unlucky cards, but you could use them to tell a story or you could use them um, in terms of like a winning or losing thing where like the luckiest player would win. And so you would have a certain number of each card and you could like have different combinations of them. Um, and there would be like different symbols on each card that would tell you what they could match with. Okay, um, cool. So the effect could it's change. Been a really or... time since I thought about it. <laughs> so I'm probably not describing it very well. So what are you working at the, on at the moment? So I've still got my big project for Draco Studios going on. I also have um, my, my biggest sensitivity reading project yet, because um, I work with a company called Salt and Sage Books, and they do they specialize in editorial services. Mm -hmm. So I'm a reader for them. Okay. And I've got my first um, deep developmental edit, and it's like a historical romance, which should be fun. Um, so I've got to go through it in like proper detail and talk about all the concepts as well as doing a sensitivity reading of it because there's a mixed race character in it. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, I'm going to be in a panel on May 30th chatting about sensitivity reading with some other people who are in that kind of industry. Um, so I'm preparing for that. I, I always, I always have the book that I'm working on. <laughs> um, that has been very stop and start. I'm hoping maybe I will have a chance to um, focus on it soon. But every time I say that, something else comes up that is something that will be more profitable. So I always end up focusing on that. So um, that's why it keeps going on the back burner. Um, then there's stuff of the Patreon and there's Rusty Quill stuff. Um, so now I think, oh, and there's the live streams that I'm doing. So now I think about it, I am actually quite busy. but. I think just because I'm inside, I'm like, I can't be that busy, but I am actually. <laughs> yeah, it's quite weird. You know, uh, we bought early this year. I don't know if you've seen those uh, diaries, because that's, that's what they are. They are diaries. It's called One Line a Day. So they are little books like that, and you're supposed to, to write four lines every day. And uh, when I fill them uh, in the evening, I always start, I haven't done much today. And I start listing yes. the four or five things I did. I'm like... Huh. Yeah, I did a stream, I did a playtest, uh, I typed that, I released that episode which I edited. Yeah, it's not bad on top of taking care of my son and cooking the dinner and, and so on. It's uh, yeah. it's not that bad, it's not that bad, but uh, there's a, the <laughs> element of repetition also. It sort of make each death feel... It becomes diffic difficult to... I don't know, time seems even shorter than it, than usually. You know, this thing of when you look back, you're like, wow, it's been a year, wow. And now I'm like, it's been six months of 2020. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been... so strange. Because I guess because I haven't done it, like, for so long now, I've not done anything that's really involved going outside. The last time I went outside was, like, for a doctor's appointment. Um, Like, as in, like... And by outside for me, like I walk around um, in my immediate neighborhood, but like last time I got on a bus or a tube yeah. was like maybe over two months ago now. And that's so bizarre. It's so strange for me because I'm quite, the reason that um, I've been able to be, well, part of the reason I've been able to be successful as a freelancer is because I'm really good at being focused by myself. And I like, um, my own space and I like my own company but I could balance that with having a quite an active social life and now I don't really have that <laughs> um so everything's going online and then that's a really different kind of being tired I saw someone having a conversation about it on Twitter where it was like um you're you're giving your own energy towards something but you're not feeling it back if that makes sense like, yes totally I can see you and I can hear you but I can't touch you I can't sense you as like a physical presence and so our brains are like what is this and that it's hard to reconcile the different information yeah the the only thing which has been giving back to me was playing some games with 
uh, with people. I found a new gaming group, and uh, the mm. way we played, the the, the yeah, they, they give me a lot of energy. It, the game, the sessions were quite intense, and each session we play a different game. So I ran my game. Uh, we tried becoming, which is quite interesting. Last week we played a a French game, which is available in English, and uh, I recommend. It's called uh, Sonia and Conan versus the Ninjas. And uh, <laughs> and one player plays the barbarian, who's uh, 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 non-gender, because technically the barbarian is both Conan and Sonia at once. One player plays the barbarian, and the three others play everybody else, the ninja. So it's, uh, it's the opposite of a GM-less game. It's a three GM game. And uh, yeah, no, but I've been playing with them, and it's been feeding me a bit. Doing the playtest has been feeding me a bit, but it's... It's also really weird how my, uh, I don't know if it's the right word, but entourage is not entourage like the f people follow me around, but uh, my, the people I engage with are completely different. I engage very little with the people I used to engage with physically, mm. and I engage a bit more with my parents than I used to, and I engage with people who used to be perfect strangers, or people like who used to be childhood friends, but I haven't heard from in 15 years. And yeah, I, I'm engaging with people based on availability and intent online rather than uh, geographical, physical availability mm. than being uh, around and so on. So I play with people who are in France. I engage with people who are in Belgium and my parents who are abroad, but not so much with, with my friends in London. That's That's kind of weird. Yeah. And it's, um, to me, I don't think it says anything about our relationships with those people because like everything is so weird for everyone emotionally right now. And there are, there are those friendships where you could not talk for like a year. And then when you see them again, it's like you just slot back in. But um, I don't know. I keep thinking, oh, I should talk to this person. Oh, I should talk to that person. And then the end of the day comes and I have free time and I'm like, I'm too tired. I'm so tired, like I can't, it's so strange being like worn out by socialization, um, even though you've not met anyone. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. Especially, especially with people that I usually game with. It's also, because that's... sorry, it, it's also, I think that there's an aspect of what, of the, what do you call that? It's not necessarily random, but you know the opportunities you you in physically normally you engage with people based on opportunities because you show up in a place where they show up to or you work in the same area mm. and you run into each other you, you you know you don't take a commitment you you're more like hey what are you up to uh, i'm in the neighborhood you want to do something and oh well, yeah yes yeah, let's, let's yeah, have lunch yeah. together and i found out that other people i engage with and again perfect strangers uh, first, it was with Francita, who I, I pretty much don't know. Uh, she's a graphic designer from Chile. Uh, she's been working with Olivia Hill, I believe, on um, uh, High End. And she, she just posted mm -hmm. on Twitter, I'm working on something graphic design, I'm, and I'm going to be in my chat room in my Discord. Uh, whoever wants to come hang out, come over and hang out. And I, and I went there, and there were other people, and we just chatted like that like you would run into people in a pub and now I started doing it sometimes when I edit on my discord I leave the chat room open and people just show up but like hey who are you oh are you that person oh what are you doing I never chatted with you and so on but you got this aspect of not having to okay tonight you're gonna take an appointment with my best friend to have this meaningful meaningful time at 7.30 p.m. exactly um. till 9 p.m. it's too you cannot really, uh, you know, make that happen on demand. It's not, it's not the same. It's not. It's like spontaneity. It's difficult to create spontaneity online mm. this way, I guess. Yeah. I don't know, but for me, I kind of, I'm starting to need to schedule things in, to, sort of be able to check in with people because I think. <sighs> At the minute, like my work is giving me quite a lot of structure. And if something is not built into my work structure, then I, it just falls by the wayside. So I'm finding it difficult to 
take part in things that are spontaneous. Um, apart from like Discord stuff, I'm in a, I'm, I'm, I'm in the um, the official Rusty Quill Discord uh, with all of our fans. That's always really fun to like because they're always they theorize so much more about the podcast than I do. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I'm just like, yeah, that happened. And then they're like, oh, but what if this is actually linked to this from way back in episode 12? And then this is this. And then, and they've got all their red string everywhere. And I'm just like, eh. <laughs> That must be so weird to play something and you have this uh, back, background team of people who are thinking about your character and what you're doing in between yeah. sessions. <laughs> I mean, it's... Like you, you just said something in passing, and then they, they work out uh, a theory. Or I guess a jo just having a joke, catching up, and p having people discuss it uh, again and again. That must be mm. yeah, that must be something. I mean, yeah, it's weird, but um, for me, it's not yet. It's not weird in a in a bad way at all. At first, it was um, a bit of a surprise, but now as time has gone on, and I've seen how much the things that I intend as sort of quite throwaway lines, how much people can be like, oh, what does this mean? <laughs> and it's made me actually start thinking a lot more about my character and um, sort of thinking out about like scenarios that I think are going to come up and how she's going to react and stuff like that. So I think um, being aware of having such an active audience has actually made me a better player slash actor. Yeah, you you do a performance. Uh, what I when I'm asked about podcasting and so on, uh, what I try to tell people, especially doing actual play, they got an extra player in the room, and that's the audience, and they they yeah. need to to yeah to to perform for them as well. They they need to to create uh, opportunity of stuff to enjoy. It's uh, it's it's not selfless, but yeah, it needs to be generous, I guess, the way you you role play. Yeah, and something interesting that um, Lydia has said before is that because the way that we play it, it's us, the players, chatting as well as the characters, so we, we swap in between. But um, when we chat as the players, it's still a bit of a performance. I'm sort of performing as out-of-character Helen as well as my character. I'm not sure... If, like, Lydia would explain this a lot better, but... Um, it's like I am still different even when I'm just chatting on the podcast than I am in real life, if that makes sense. Oh, definitely. you. I, I mean, I, I I do sometimes actual play, but most of what I do is uh, interviews, discussion. But, I mean, I even have the name I take, I introduce myself online and so on, is Kalum. It's a persona. It's a persona I have for the podcast, yeah. and it's not quite. I mean, in a way, I guess Kalum is slightly more defined than than Jeremy because Jeremy is whatever I am and whatever mood I am in when I'm doing something, and I'm very different at work. I, I would be even very different on certain projects compared to others, or at one employer compared to to another. And I'm different for for friends I used to have at uni, friends uh, when I was uh, in high school in Belgium, friends I'm with now. And but Kaluma sort of have a a few things is there for for me like it's supposed to be more positive. So so when I'm in a Kalum situation, it can be live in front front in a, at a live event. But when I'm the organizer and so on, I. Uh, I got a switch going on in my head saying, okay, you're, you're Calum, so you're not, you're not going to get mad about, let's say, the political situation. You, you might, <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean I forget my opinions and so on, or I'm not shy about my opinions, but Calum doesn't get upset, sort of. So yeah. it's sort of my persona, and it's, it's kind of soothing and relaxing to, uh, to have that persona for me, so... So yeah, you yeah. you always have that, and I think also people do it. It's not just a performance thing. I think when you show up within a group, you adopt different persona because you try to assess what yeah. this group is about. So you try to adapt yourself for for that. So have you ever had the experience? You 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 got like your birthday coming, 
and I had that especially when I when I was studying architecture. And you got your group of friends from my school. In my case, we did theater and role playing games together. And then I have my friends from uh, uni who uh, smoke drugs with, <laughs> you know, the the more artists and so on. And and then I, I got my my birthday party. I'm having it at my grandmother's house. It's a big barbecue. I invite everybody, and suddenly you got the two groups come together, and you sort of torn in between because your, you know, the mm. the image they have with you. They even the, what they called me was different. I had a nickname which yeah. was different with one and the others. It's kind of a tearing you apart in terms of of experience. So so you do that. People do that. They just yeah. don't really realize I mean, it. Personality is performative depending on who you're with. And I think um, that's not, and that's not a bad thing. And that's not to say that um, any part of like who you are with different people is fake. It's just that different people bring out different things in you. And when it comes to performing in front of an audience, it's like um, that thing about how, I don't know if it's quantum physics or whatever, I'm not a scientist, but when you look at certain atoms, the act of you looking at them makes them change. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. That's, that's what it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got that so in, in nature that also. Yeah. Yeah, I think that yeah, it's a good call. Uh, personality is is performative, and as you say, it's it, it's not lying or being deceitful. It's just different yeah. facets of your personality which finds yeah. a way and it's to. It's just bouncing off different people. I would because I'm a very different person if I'm with like um, like say I'm in like two different gaming groups. I tend to play completely different characters depending on who I'm with. Like one group is like more sort of gaming focused and the other group is full of improv comedians. So I have, um, I'm acting to different expectations and there are completely different vibes in both of those rooms. So I am going to be different in both ways. Do you also like, because I, I found that uh, it's not the case of all the tabletop RPG fans, I, I try. I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm. I'm not always successful at it, but I like to attempt to play characters who are very different, to explore very different things. Play a uh, mm. a cleric obsessed with his religion, or uh, and who's kind of not picking up on social clues, or, or the opposite, playing someone who's the face of a group like I don't know in a, sh a shadow run, so who's very good with social things and uh, playing someone nice playing someone very lawful someone very chaotic do do you like to go across the range like that or do you do you have your things where you you got your comfort and uh, and you prefer to to sort of stick to them i mean i have two main sort of archetypes for who i play like one of them is the character i play in rusty quill azu who's like uh you know good with a capital g and um you know, means means well and tries to do her best. And then I've got characters that I play in other games where I'm just absolutely awful. I like to play assassins and like angry people and people <laughs> who like hit things hard. But if I'm given, but it's very different when it comes to um, a one shot because with one shots, my, I, I don't really mind if my character survives or not. So I just go all out. So, um, and that, I think, that can be really fun because you discover things that you can play that you didn't think you could before. So one of the one shots on the podcast, I ended up playing um, like this terrible poet who was sleeping around a cruise ship. Like, and that's not a character that I would automatically think I would, I would play. But in that room and with that game, with those people, I was like, yes, that's who I'm gonna be. And it was loads of fun. So, um, it's a bit of both. I tend to either be really nice or really horrible. And then if I know that I'm not going to be sticking around, I just do whatever. It's quite liberating a one shot. Uh, you know, you, yes. when, when you have a one shot, you, you don't have to, to care about the consequences too much. And you, mm -hmm. you're in a trustful, trustful position with the game master. It's, it's great to lose yourself into, into somebody else. Yeah, and just be like, well, why not do this? Um, I remember the first time I played a Cthulhu game and I was pretty sure that like our characters weren't going to survive 
And that gave me a certain amount of freedom to just do whatever I wanted. Because <laughs> I was like, well, doesn't matter. Um, I really enjoyed that. I think that was a Cthulhu Dark game that I played first. There's a, there's a game I would like to play again. Uh, I, I really like the concept. So it's called Becoming. And you play. You need four players. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got it's got similarities with the other game I was describing. But so one player plays the the hero, and uh, will just play the hero. And the other three role player players play each a fate, but they take turn with the the different fates. And uh, yeah, I mean it's a classical fate. So the three the three of them have different roles. But when you're playing one of the fate on one turn, you play one of the role, and then you switch with the others. But the, what's interesting is that you, the hero will succeed, the hero they will survive, but the point of the game it's called the the designer calls it a drama generator. You are supposed to make the the hero suffer, and as a fate, what you're supposed to come up with is difficult choices like. Okay, mm. this is gonna dema damage uh, damage the the starship you're on uh, in a very serious way, or you're gonna lose a member of your crew, or you're gonna lose one member of your crew, this one or this one. Which one I is it gonna be? But what's mm. nice is that because because the the agreement is that the hero will succeed. Yeah, it can be very hard at the same time, but you you don't have to worry too much about. Oh, I don't want to lose the game. You're gonna win the game, but the idea is that you you will suffer at it. Mm. So that's something that's really interesting to me—the idea of winning or losing in a role-playing game. Like, it's not really. I don't know. I find that that can be that can be quite problematic, because people will try and, even if that's not the purpose of the game, and it obviously it depends on what what you're playing. But when you get players who want to win, that can lead to like such railroady tactics sometimes. Um, not just by the GM, but by other players as well. They're like, "Well, I'm going to go and do this," and they end up going somewhere by by themselves, and you're forced to go along with it or not. And yeah, there's kind of a balance to find, and again, it's a it's a yeah. question of trust. Uh, I already mentioned on this show, yeah, but yeah, yeah. so I join a campaign with friends from childhood I hadn't played with them for 15 years and I joined a campaign with them and I f found out and it's I mean it's, it's I guess in a way it's a judgment but uh, they're, they're having fun so they're, they're not doing anything wrong with the way they play role playing games but I was not having fun and part of that was because I found they were still playing role playing games as we played in the late 90s and it, yeah, it was yeah. very uh, it's it's quite weird. It's a weird sort of. Um, it's not railroady. It's it's more sandboxy, but at the same time, things are very set in the mind of the game master. He's got this logic of what would work and what would not work, and you mm. s and as the player in that those tables, you're supposed to work out what's their logic. And it's yeah. exhausting. And if you don't, if you do things which don't align with the logic of the game master, with that specific game master, you just get slapped in the face repeatedly. <laughs> which, to some extent, to add on top of things, is sort of the point with his tables, because what he digs is, uh, and even if those showed up later, it's stuff like Game of Thrones, things which are dark. And I just left the campaign because I was not only there was an issue of, of the thing being don't beat, don't beat, don't beat, don't beat, rather than being don't beat, a beat, investigative beat, uh, action beat, mm. but also I, I realized that when I was at the table, I was very stressed because I was thinking very hard what was the right thing to do rather than the narrative, you know, the, the thing which makes sense for my character. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and not only me, but when I would see other players doing stuff, me and the other players would stress over what that player was doing, rather than let that mm. player do her or his thing. And it's just, it's not fun. We're supposed to play FBI agents coming first of their class out of the academy. And mm. 
your first session is okay uh, uh operation of uh, rescuing someone kidnapped and you you smashed completely your team because guess what i wasn't trained in hostage rescue <laughs> and 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 it doesn't feel like the game master is it's not exactly against us but he he's not it doesn't feel like he's a fan of the characters you know he's not yeah. oh you did that thing that wasn't very smart to do bam this consequence happens to you rather than be like yeah but you wouldn't write the character failing I mean you don't show Silence of the Lamb the first time you see Clarice telling she she doesn't hit her head on the door <laughs> or something like that <laughs> so, so you could still you know that's the thing not winning the game, but if you feel like you're losing or that you got stuff oh. to lose, it's hard to yeah to lose yourself again in the role and uh, in the story rather yeah. than concentrate on okay what's the logic here what's the logic thing to do. I'm really lucky that I've never had a GM make me feel like that really. Mm. Um, because I mean, there's also like you said that you you were stressed about your decisions, but there's like there's good stress and bad stress. Mm -hmm. And so like the stress I enjoy is where I'm like, oh no, what will happen? But the bad stress is where you're like, um, have I made the right choice? Like where it's about you rather than the game and the character. Um, I mean, what do you think makes a good GM? Oh, uh, I think it's you know I. I don't like the debate about what a game should or should not be in terms of should it be Ray Roddy, should it be sandboxy, should it be even even question about whether or not racism has its place in a story. Uh, I don't find there's a set answer for that. But I think a, a good GM listens. That doesn't yes. mean he, he cannot be Ray Roddy in what he does, but he listens and make, make things... Uh, Align with what is going on, so he is reactive. So that doesn't mean not having a, something very linear or predetermined. Uh, I had a, one of the best game I had was a Call of Tulu game with Joe Trier from All Reroll Podcast, and it was a very linear story. But it was great actually because we didn't have to. Again, thinking of other games of Call of Tulu when I played Mask of Nyarlat, we were like thinking very hard. Oh, we. We don't know where, where the investigation is supposed to be going. Um, are the clues we're, clues we're supposed to pick up? I mean, it's fine for one session, but several sessions, it, it's, it's a bit hard. But because that, that one was very linear, we were completely available for being our characters and me to concentrate on yeah. being the divorced father of a child who disappeared, having to bend with uh, the new husband of his wife to find the child who dis disappeared in a in a camping trip, and I was all into this character who was a construction worker, who was insecure. The other guy was more white collar, uh, mm -hmm. and he was very proud of his kid. I would my character would always say, "Well, my kid is smart. My kid, she's smart, you know." And you know, you go into that and you develop the relationship between you and the the other characters, and you're not there to be, oh, I missed my investigation clue, uh, role or I didn't connect the dot in the story. No, it was just you go to the encampment, uh, you find someone, you follow a trail and then you find the children, you realize what's going on, it's weird and doesn't make sense and you, you try to react with emotion of what it's like to, to have a father who, who find a, his child possessed and he just wants to, to save her. and. I wouldn't play that all the time, but you know, it, it's nice. That's something I, I like. But that doesn't mean the. Yeah. And again, it was linear, but that doesn't mean the game master was not listening to what we were saying and giving us mm -hmm. hooks to give him more of that, giving more energy and make it make it rebound. But so yeah, I guess that yeah. Yeah. Listening. Like, I don't think it's ever a problem of how much or how little structure a game has. I think it's so much more about the GMs. Uh, a relationship with the players in my experience like I could do any kind of like A to B campaign and not care as long as I'm having fun and I think that's <sighs> it sounds like the worst games are where people forget that you're meant to be enjoying it <laughs> yeah yeah that, that's a weird thing with that, that game master and again he's running games maybe three times a, a, a week and his tables are full 
me when I run tables sometimes I struggle to have players so he's probably doing something uh, much better at least for his audience that, that I'm doing but uh, yeah it, it's, it's like he puts the integrity of some element of the plot or the logic of his world above the 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 fun and the enjoyment of of the player the, even the integrity will matter most than the survival of the campaign i i've seen that like yeah. the, my first session with him was like that star wars uh one player decides to go to a bowl where dark vader is and we are a resistant group going there Ooh. and yeah so i mean you could have that on campaign podcast or any Star Wars podcast redemption and it becomes a scene which is very interesting but in the logic of the game master it meant no we were not discreet enough that was very nonsensical to do that especially when one of the characters was exceptionally gorgeous so she she got noticed at the ball and we all ended up in a imperial jail tortured or, or interrogated and and they found out who we were and what we were about and the, the campaign was killed. <laughs> TPK. And the, the game master was also, the, the game master was also convinced that uh he was being generous because the interrogation was taking place in front of one another. So we knew that the even when an imperial would tell us, Well your friends they, they gave away the, the secret, we knew they didn't. But that combined plus a, a player who was the one who initiated the ball, who was a push the red button player when he was getting bored or not having fun, he would push the button and destroy everything around him. The player just said, no, I give it away. I said all our secrets to the <laughs> Imperial agent and the, the campaign was killed. My My very first session with that game master because, oh yeah, no, uh, no, no, in the in my logic, Going to the ball would mean that you immediately captured by the Empire. So, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you master yourself? Occasionally, very occasionally. Um, I do, um, so I tend to, the last couple of times I've done it, I've put so much thought into like the NPCs and stuff, and but I've never, in terms of where the actual game is going, I've had like a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and everything else I've just left up to the players. Um, the first time I tried that, it was a Monster Hearts game, and that was vaguely in line with what I thought was going to happen. At least that there was some. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't prepared at that time for how much players can surprise you. Mm -hmm. Like they like there was this one character who was like my exposition box. And I was trying to to play him like, you know, like 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 someone interesting. They should, um, you know, that could tell them loads loads of information. And they all hated him, and like <laughs> and like put him in a cupboard and left him there. And I was like, your your information. <laughs> um, that was fun. And then. Um, I don't know. I think what one of the excitements about being a games master is giving up so much of the control to your players because I'm never going to tell someone no you can't do that. Um like unless I've got like an actual proper reason for it. Like some very occasionally um Alex at the Rusty Quill will say please don't do this because and then he'll explain how it would absolutely break his world or something like that and then that's fine. <laughs> but um <laughs> you know i would never sort of kill a load of characters because um unless there was no way out of it really i try i try to avoid killing characters yeah um, but you know it's funny it was funny playing with that game master because i even know the game master of that game master so i played with the game master who sort of brought him in the hobby and i could tell that some similarities and playing with him again made me realize, because he was my first game master, that there are things I did which was a bit like that. So again, it's not a criticism of the way he's doing things. Again, his players are having fun. I was the one not having fun. But it yeah. made me realize, oh, wait a second. When he does that, he does that, he does that. And personally, it's not to my taste. 
that's something I did to other player, and I know it was not to their taste. So it's it's interesting to have to shed shed the light on uh, on, on something. Yeah. I mean, it's all a learning curve. Um, I think that as long as everyone's having fun, and there's no good or bad way to do it. I think everyone's got their own style. Yeah. Um, so so much of the success of a game depends on the people who are in the group. Definitely. It's like. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, you know, advice for game masters and question what's good or, or bad game mastering. Uh, we were having the, uh, a short discussion with Misdirected Mark podcast about the fact that uh, they're considering producing more advice for players. But the question is whether or not the players will go to and consume that advice. But uh, yeah, the uh, players have a job to do. <laughs> It it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if the game master is listening, if the the players are not Aren't saying yeah. much or saying stuff which <laughs> before they themselves did not listen to what was going on uh, and so on. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in general there's a problem where people sort of seem to see the game as like belonging to the games master, but it actually belongs to everyone who's at the table. Um, and I think it's everyone's responsibility to take care of each other. Yeah, that's the thing. If it belongs to someone, it means you need to take care of it. It's not just an ownership thing. It's a responsibility thing. You're, you're responsible. Everyone yeah. is responsible for the fun of everyone around the table. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I think that's a major thing. <laughs> it's a, it's often missed. I am. Um... <laughs> I was uh, I did a sensitivity reading of a, a game that's coming out soon, um, and it had a little section in it that was sort of because it's a GMless game. It said something like everyone should be a fan of everyone else's character, like you should all want them to do like interesting, exciting things, and you know, like give them opportunities to be cool. And I think that that was that was a really good point that that writer made. Um, I think that's why it's nice to play. Uh, I'm not. I'm not the biggest fan of GMless games, but I think they are very, and a very invaluable experience to have, even once in a while to you know hone that uh, that ability to listen to one another. You know, to, to cultivate that to yeah. then go to yeah. a quotation mark classic role playing game. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I think. Um... I'd like to try more gemless games. I don't have I don't have like a major preference one way or the other because I think um there are pros and cons to both. But I've only tried like 3. <laughs> I'm still quite um uh behind I feel because I only started getting involved in tabletop gaming in like 2014. So for me it's not been as long for me as for lots of other people who are in the hobby. I mean, pff, you always find people who had more experience and people who had less experience. It's uh, mm. there's just so much going on, and uh, and again, <laughs> again, it's even in terms of uh, it's a question of curiosity. Uh, you you can spend. You, you could have been playing for. I mean, I had someone come with a big rant. I think it was the first person I ever blocked from my page on Facebook. I just Ooh. post I just posted an announcement that Chaosium was to publish a French game in English. It's called Worm, and you play uh, prehistory uh, characters. And that person posted like, uh, "1986 is calling, and they want this stupid idea back," uh, uh. and with a cover of GURPS. Prehistor uh, a prehistorical setting for GURPS, official GURPS thing. And then tongue in cheek, just to try to ease him up, I was like, well, I wouldn't say GURPS was such a bad idea <laughs> from the 80s. And he, he just, yeah, replied so, uh, so hardly. And I was like, you know, ideas can be badly treated or taken, so maybe the idea wasn't good in that supplement you read, but it might be good in that new game. And he was like, well, huh, we, we, I never actually read that book. We, it was just sitting on a shelf <laughs> in the shop where we were playing in the, the, the 80s. And me and all the other players would point at it regularly and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, 
why you're not gonna teach me role playing games I've been playing since the the mid 70s and I was like what are you talking about oh my God. <laughs> why are you getting so excited <laughs> about this thing you dislike <laughs> so, yeah okay right bye <laughs> you're not welcome yeah. But that person's been playing since the mid-70s, and yeah, I dare say, I mean, if he's having fun, he's doing it right, but he doesn't seem to be having that much fun, so maybe he should yeah. try new things. I mean, even to find out that it's not his cup of tea, but yeah, it was... Mm. Wow! <laughs> Why? It's that thing where, like, when someone gets too much into a hobby, like, so much that it becomes their identity, they start to take all kinds of things super personally. And I think it's it's one of those problems with like fandom in general that you know over the, over the last couple of years have become more and more apparent. Where if something happens in their franchise or game or whatever that they don't like, just absolutely go off the rails because they see it as like a personal attack on them. Um, and I think that there's that kind of thing happening in sort of uh, like rival gaming camps sometimes. I think also like for example, I would never say I would never say that Dungeons and Dragons is my favorite game, and I definitely think it has flaws and stuff. But I would never yell at someone for playing it, you know. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, uh, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I keep saying stuff about Dungeons and Dragons. I keep saying uh, I like Dungeons and Dragons, and then come up with criticism, but. Yeah, I'm not mm. yelling at people. Why? Why? Yeah, it's it's frustrating. Uh, I guess you've seen like everybody. It, it's frustrating how people signal boost something they dislike, even if they're against it, they will still signal boost it. And I was so frustrated. I'm so frustrated. There's so many good shows, and uh, hopefully mine is one of them to some extent. But it's so difficult to have people share the stuff you do. And say, oh, you should listen to that. Even when you see the number and see, oh, there's that many people doing it. It's it's very impressive. You got something like the Rustic Wheel or the Magnus Archive, who reach sort of this critical mass of fans, and it, they got these qualities which make that fans do go out and and recommend what they do. But I was very annoyed by uh, what happened with Miss Monopoly because everybody, I don't know if you've seen that. Were well, you lucky? Is that is that an Animal Crossing? No, or something. no, it's it's an ad, uh, and uh, I guess. Oh, I think I think I just saw a meme. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw a meme where someone put Miss Monopoly in Animal Crossing. So I, I didn't. I saw I saw a picture of her, but I don't know what that's about or what it is. Well, it was a uh, an ad, and uh, maybe I'm paranoid, but I think it was intended to trigger people from the publicist. But it's a very long ad. So picture an ad for like Microsoft or something like ACP, something very corporate, lush, lushly filmed. And you see little girls and they work in a garage assembling something. And it's, it's super, you know, th this very American corporate well shot uh, raising the tension and the emotion, saying what's going on with those little girl making inventions, and you don't know what the product is till the very, very end. And at the very, very end, those three or four little girls, several of them being from minorities, they got this big box present and then unwrap it, and inside it, it's a brand, it's a new Monopoly called Miss Monopoly, which is especially for women. And it's got special rules Ooh. in it, and it's yeah, it's it's very cringy. Yeah, that so, hits me as like that big pen for women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and yeah, if if you tell the whole story, because some people defended it to me, saying, okay, but you do know that because it's been cut from the edit, which has been shared in the box. There were two thousand dollars for them to work on their invention. But it's it's Miss Monopoly. That's not the point of it. Yeah, that's it? not the point. <laughs> that's but the like um, that's a company being like uh, fake woke. Yeah, you know, they're gonna tap into that market. Especially <laughs> after doing Millennials Monopoly and so on. Uh, but but what really annoys me is that everybody shared it. I had zero interest mm. in it, and I've seen it. Not only people working in tabletop, but like my favorite blogger vloggers posted it. Like people like Lindsay Ellis. Uh, podcasts which are absolutely not about uh, tabletop it was everywhere for two days and 
everywhere with 90% of the people sharing saying, look at this thing, are you for real? Uh, is this thing real that's so stupid, that's so insulting? Yeah, but everybody was still sharing it. Why don't you share, yeah. I don't know, a haunted yeah. west or something positive, something you want to support instead of signal boosting something? Because the publicist, at the end of the day, they still got the money. <laughs> Great <laughs> job! They, 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 they can say, hey, we made that campaign everybody heard of. And uh, they, we can tell to our client, look, 3 million retweets on Twitter, uh, even if it's 90% oh. people hate us. It's just this, yeah, cultural thing of, yeah, discussing more stuff it's we don't like. It's clicks. It's the yeah. whole thing, like, so many newspapers will post a headline that they know is going to rile people up and get them to share it, being like, I can't believe they said this. Ugh, it's a nightmare. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anything left uh, from you uh, positive to, to share and maybe your goodbye? Because it's going to be time for me to wake up my son. Oh, um, then I would say if anyone's interested in sensitivity reading, if they're writing a book or a game or anything like that, uh, come along to the uh, panel that we're having that's May 30th, 7.30, and it's being hosted by Welcome to the Party. I believe their Twitter is uh, Welcome Party RPG. And we're going to have about an hour chatting about what it is, when you should get a sensitivity reader, stuff we come across, that kind of thing. I think it's hosted by a friend of the show, Paulina, from the London RPG community also. Yeah, yeah, she's moderating. Yeah, but she's moderating. But, um, because it's on Twitch, we got... Um, uh, a sensitive tutor called Leona Maple is part of Welcome to the Party and so she was like we can just go there there'll be a nice little crossover so that's what we did cool I love crossovers like that I try to <laughs> to tune in I, I, but I, I don't watch that many Twitch shows uh, I consume things more in audio I stream more than I than I watch things anyway where can people find you if you wish to be found oh um, come follow me on Twitter. That's at Alecto101. That's A L E C T O 101. And um, I post about everything I'm doing there. What but is that? At the minute, it's Hannibal. <laughs> what is Alecto actually? Uh, she is one of the Furies that helped to start the Trojan War. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Nothing like the Trojan I'm a classics nerd. Oh, I love classics. <laughs> I should have you for a game of Nephilim. Uh, I'll send you a, I'll send you an episode I recorded about that French game. It starts as Tro Tro Troy is burning. So, Ooh. so yeah, it's a historical game. Well, it's not. Well, I send you a link. You tell me what what you think uh, of it. Well, thank you so much for joining, Helen. We we should interact more often than uh, once in a while when you happen to be seated next to me at Dragon Meet. I think that's what we had to like. It must be all. F Third interaction, one uh, Satin Phoenix event, once Dragon Meat, maybe twice Dragon Meat. So, yeah, we should do more <laughs> stuff together. Yeah, I'd like that. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, who tuned in. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, cheers. Bye. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, I will be having with my guest Paco from GMS Magazine, a fellow uh, tabletop vlogger from Spain. Uh, so, yeah, should be cool. Thanks, bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>